Greetings. Welcome to this discussion on the Ten Commandments as being a political theology. Today we're going to talk about coveting. But before we get into the actual commandment, I want to answer a question that I'm sure one or two of you are going to ask. And the question is this. Are there one or two commandments addressing coveting? And the answer is, it depends. It depends upon which church tradition you belong to. Which church do you attend? If you're Lutheran, or if you're Roman Catholic, the answer is there are two covenant commandments. There is the ninth commandment and the tenth commandment. If you are Jewish, if you are a member of the Greek or Russian Orthodox Church, if you are a member of the Reformed churches, the answer is one. Just the tenth commandment. The reason for the difference is these different bodies number the commandment, the second commandment, differently. And depending upon how you number the second commandment depends upon how many covenant commandments you have. Now, at the end of the day, the material is all the same, none of the words are left out. And, and so we can just treat them as one or two and it won't make any difference for our discussion, even though I'm Lutheran, I'm going to deal with it as if there is only one commandment. I also want to share before we get into the commandment uh, another insight. And the insight is that the commandment not to covet is one of the two bookends for the other commandments. You will remember in our first session, our second session, I'm sorry, that uh, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, was not only a matter of doing something, but it was a matter of the heart. It was a matter of believing something in your heart, that it was God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It was that belief that built trust and faith. And so the first commandment established for us that faith, trust, was very important in following what God wanted us to do. And now we come to the uh, end of the commandments and where the first commandment was a bookend at the beginning of the commandments, the commandment and coveting is the second bookend. And coveting takes us into our heart. It takes us into our consciousness. It takes us into our motivation for doing something. And so at the two ends of the commandments, the first commandment and the last commandment on coveting, deal with the heart. And then the commandments in between them deal with our behaviors. But because we have the two bookends, the commandments in between them are not just a moral list of ethics and you just check off the box. They deal with our whole being. They deal with our spirituality. They deal with our psychological and emotional feelings. They deal with our physical body. And so therefore the commandments such as we are to not wrongfully use God's name or we are to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Or we are to honor our father and our mother, as well as civic leaders uh, that govern over us. We are to not to kill. We are not to commit adultery. 
we are not to steal and we are not to bear false witness. The book ants say, just not a moral checklist, but this is who we are, what we are, in every aspect of our life. Now, with this insight and knowing how many times the covenant commandment occurs, uh, let's turn to the commandment itself. And the commandment reads this way. You shall not covet in your heart your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I want to stress the italics are mine. And there are mine just because of what I've just previously said. I believe this commandment is the second bookend and affects the whole body. And so therefore, it has to come from our hearts. So what does it mean not to covet? I can tell you that every book that I've ever read on the Ten Commandments and every commentary I've read in Deuteronomy or in Exodus, every author has had a different definition. There is no common definition for coveting. So I've chosen two from two different scholars. And the first one is, coveting is to yearn to possess something so badly you are willing to take it from another person. Or, to say it may be even stronger, <clears throat> coveting is to want something so badly it becomes an obsession. Now think about that. And think about a minute ago we read the commandment. I want my neighbor's house. I covet my neighbor's house. The house here represents everything that the neighbor owns all of the neighbor's physical property. And when I covet my neighbor's house, the coveting becomes an obsession and the obsession becomes, I'm going to go take it. I want that more and I deserve it more and I need it more than my neighbor. So it is all right. It is justified. You simply go take it. Now, wife and, and the slaves and the servants and the animals also belong, or at least it was thought that they belonged to the neighbor. So I covet my neighbor's wife. I'm obsessed with my neighbor's wife. And I'm going to have my neighbor's wife. The obsession and I'm going to have my neighbor's wife has the great potential of leading me into adultery. Now we need to be careful here because the scholars who wrote these two definitions would also say there's nothing wrong with admiring your neighbor's house. And there's nothing wrong with thinking your neighbor's wife is attractive. But don't get into where you can steal it because you want it. And don't get into an affair or inappropriate relationships because you want it. Coveting leads to real problems. So watch how you think. Watch how you what you do with what you think. Now, if this is what coveting is. What causes it? And I'm going to suggest to you that coveting has two causes. I'm sure it has more, but these are the two that that I think really jump out. Coveting is caused by overvaluing what others have. 
and coveting is caused by undervaluing what we have or what you have. In other words, I value more what my uh, neighbor has, and in comparison, I don't value what I have. And so when we overvalue something, it often, if not always, undervalues what we have. Now, I want to put this in terms of a congregation. Because a major theme for these whole seven weeks is that these commandments were written for, first and foremost, a collective group. A nation called Israel, synagogue, Congregation, worldwide church. In order to look at this commandment from the perspective of a congregation, I, I want to go to a book called uh, Natural Church Development. And in that book, the author says there are seven, uh, there are eight categories that every church has, eight, eight different ways of doing ministry. And the first one is leadership. And the second one is having a ministry portfolio. And the third is seeking spirituality. And the fourth is organizational structures. And the fifth is worship. And the sixth is small groups. And the seventh is evangelism. And finally the eighth is relationships. Now, Every congregation has or strives to have these eight components. And so every congregation probably should be said, theoretically anyway, they're all the same. But the author goes on to say they're not the same, and what differentiates congregations from each other is adjectives placed before these eight components of a congregation. And the adjectives are empowering leadership. Does the leadership empower its members to participate and deliver ministries, not only to assume responsibility, but to assume authority in delivering ministry? Is it a gift-based ministry? Do we ask our members to serve because it matches their spiritual gifts? Or do we ask members to serve our congregation because there's an empty slot on a committee required by the Constitution? Do we have passionate spirituality? My favorite definition of spirituality is looking for and seeing God present in this world intervening into the lives of my country, my community, my church, and among my friends. Functional structures. Is our congregation organized in the administrative structures for ministry or to match a constitution passed down from a denomination? Is our worshiping inspiring? Do people come eagerly to sing the hymns, to hear the gospel read, to witness the sacraments, to get ready to go back out into the world to do God's mission in this world? Or, as we have been accused in the church too often, worship is boring. Are our small groups holistic? By that, what is meant, our small groups are not just a matter of sitting down and looking at a Bible verse and memorizing it, but they allow discussion. They allow uh, challenges. Uh, they allow various opinions. And occasionally the group will wander off to where 
uh, members can share with others their, their hurts and their pains, and equally as important, their joys and their successes. Need-based evangelism is identifying a need in the local community around and then asking what resources do we have to meet that need and then going out and meeting that need for the betterment of the community in Jesus name. And finally loving relationships where we truly do care for each other. Now this is a good list. The commandment does certainly does not challenge anything on this list and it certainly does not challenge any of the adjectives. But the commandment does warn that as a congregation sits and looks at other congregations, it not devalue its ministries and its context and its people and its leaders and overvalue what that other church has. To a point, it's willing to leave its strengths, trying to find different strengths in another place that probably will not fit where that congregation is doing ministry. And so the coveting becomes, we really want passionate spirituality. And so we're going to go to a church that has passionate spirituality and we are going to copy exactly what they're doing. We want the recipe. It doesn't matter what our spiritual gifts are of our church and it doesn't matter uh, how we do it. We're going to throw that out because this is the only way to do it. And sometimes we get sucked into some terrible decisions because we are coveting the success of another church which is not like us. The commandment does speak to congregations. Now let me pursue that just a little bit further by looking at the spiritual gifts and I'm going to look at the spiritual gifts from the uh, book of uh, 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. And in that uh, 12th chapter of Corinthians, the first gift of the Spirit is wisdom. And the second is knowledge. And then there's faith. And then there's healing. And then there's miracles. And then there is prophecy. And then there is dis discernment of spirits. And then there are various kinds of tongue, and then there's the interpretations of tongues. Now we are taught by our theology that every member of the congregation gets at least one of these gifts for the building up of the congregation, according to Ephesians. And that every congregation has members, so all of these gifts are present. And when all of the gifts are present and all of the members work together, the congregation will be healthy and vibrant and alive. But what often happens is there is coveting. And my gift may very well be prophecy. But prophecy is not as good as speaking in tongues. And so I overvalue the speaking in tongues and I undervalue the gift of prophecy. By the way, prophecy is seeing how the Bible refers to Jesus in the first century. Now what congregations need to do here is set up systems so that the congregation as a whole and individuals in particular do not overvalue one of those gifts and undervalue all the rest. To set up systems where every member 
is affirmed and told, your particular gift is extremely important for us if we are to build up the church. It is to set up systems to counteract coveting what another member has in comparison to what little I have. Now, to sum this up, the commandment on coveting goes to the heart of the matter, for it is out of our heart and out of our faith and out of our trust in God, as was said in the first commandment, and I think now comes into play in this commandment, that we live a life that God that is pleasing to God and it calls us in to keep vigilance that a healthy desire to grow and to mature and to uh, and to maybe even uh, have some additional things that bring us pleasure doesn't grow into your gift and what your congregation has is better than my gift and what my congregation has. It is a marvelous, marvelous commandment to end the Ten Commandments. Now we've been here for seven sessions. And so I want to summarize what we've done together. And I want to do that not by just repeating what I've said, but by sharing with you four takeaways. Because I believe the presenter learns as much, if not more, than the participants learn in doing the research and reading and, and, and going through our thoughts and, and putting it together. And I also want to say affirmation is a learning. And sometimes the most important thing you can get out of participating or leading is it affirms what you've already believed. So let's take a look at my four uh, takeaways, and I hope you have takeaways as well. And this will inspire you to think about your takeaways. And my first takeaway is the Bible and the Ten Commandments were written to God's collective people. I've known that for a long time. I've known that for a long time. But as I worked with this, more and more there was an aha about how important this is. And it came to me someplace when I was doing about the fourth or fifth uh, uh, presentation, maybe even as late as the sixth, that if the Bible and if faith is individual, that's the primary purpose. And if the teachings of the Bible are for the individual, and if all the texts about God's grace, love, and forgiveness is for the individual, and if all the texts about accountability is for the individual, then faith is private. And if faith is private, it really has no place in the marketplace or public discourse. Those who say the church doesn't belong in the marketplace or as a part of public discourse are right. It's private. It's individual. It's personal. But if faith, if the Bible, if the Ten Commandments is for a group, for God's people, synagogue, congregation, worldwide church, if it's for organizations and how they should structure and how their core value should be for every member, then Faith, it should be a part.
part of the marketplace. And faith should be a part of public discourse. Just saying this is for a collective people changes the whole way faith is experienced and the way it's lived out. The second of my takeaways was new. We talked about that today. That the first and the last commandment are actually bookends that connect the heart, motivation, consciousness to the behaviors that exist in the other commandments. And then we have the bookend that goes back to let's look at motivation and, and what's going on. I think that's extremely important because it makes faith uh, concerned about our spirituality, about our psychology, about our feelings, and about our physical life. Third, the importance of the prelude. I always knew it was important to say why, but to see it as absolutely essential for even understanding the commandments was an aha. And while I always push to have the prelude present, I will do so even more in the future. And finally, I remember from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, and we didn't talk about this, that the commandments are not in heaven, they're not great, they're not, they're not just some high of a, this list that can't be achieved, but they are for ordinary people, and we can follow them. Thank you for being a part of this discussion. Thank you for being here for seven sessions.